quick brush up as to how what we have discussed till now so we discussed the essential qualifications for the aor exam we discussed uh, that 4 plus 1 years practice have to be your uh, 4 plus 1 years minimum practice is there you have to take a commencement certificate from uh, in the aor who has 10 years practice a continuity certificate from your bar council and you have to submit another certificate after your exam after your training is complete under the concerned advocate on record then we discussed that there are four papers practice procedure uh, drafting leading cases there's a list of leading cases of around 44 cases given by the supreme court and professional ethics then uh, each paper is subjective in nature you don't get a computer you have to write everything by hand in leading cases you get scr head notes and uh, each paper carries 100 marks you have to get minimum of 240 marks in total and minimum of 50 marks in individual paper to clear the exam after we discussed um, as to how practice and procedure should be studied practice and procedure in my view should be studied with a brief background of how the supreme court functioned and how the supreme court came into being that will start right from uh, where it was mooted for the first time that is when uh, bhagat singh's case was uh, dismissed by privy council in limi and this gave uh, rise to an uproar in the country and to a demand for a court of ultimate appeal this was i guess by hari singh gaur for the first time but it is arguable because few people say it was nehru who uh, debated this for the first time and there after the white paper of 1933 and there after the government of india act 1935 which uh, uh brought in something which was called a federal court then so the federal court had jurisdiction layered between the privy council in uk and uh, Uh, the high courts in the country uh, there were appeals directly from the high courts to the privy council but there are few appeals which go through the federal court so uh, the federal court started from 1937 somewhere in october 1937 it started so it short lived from 1937 to 1949 in between in 1946 i guess uh, 6th december when the objectors resolution was passed by the constituent assembly so 6 december 1946 and prior to that there was this cabinet mission plan which was approved thereafter under a british uh, colonial statute book that is the indian independence act 1947 um, that was passed on 18th of july 1947 there was there was this date which was called the appointed day that is 15th august there were two dominions from india and pakistan under section 8 of the indian independence act both dominions were given liberty to have their own constituent assembly to have their own legislatures and to have their own uh, sovereignty i guess on 29th august somewhere two weeks after 15th august 29th august somewhere 1947 it started when the constituent assembly perhaps met for the first time and they deliberated on how the procedure would be the constituent assembly was largely divided into eight major committees including drafting and union constitution committee which was called the ucc and the provincial constitution committee that was the pcc so the constitution and so uh uh and so there was very less debate on how judiciary should uh, function the first so what we have in the constitution right now that is that is something which is called the union judiciary then it was called in the draft constitution article 103 draft article 103 to draft article 123 that was called uh, the federal judicature and that is because we have this setup of high courts so the supreme court has no superintendence upon the high courts the high courts have superintendence upon the subordinate judiciary if it may be called a subordinate tall so yes so the provisions of jurisdiction which were for the federal court they were carried on as it is for the supreme court with slight changes here there for example something which is called article 131 clause uh, 1 abc in the constitution now that is uh, borrowed from the government of india act section 204 which had granted uh, uh, powers of original jurisdiction to the federal court Now, interestingly federal court in its entire 12 years dealt with only one case of original uh, jurisdiction that went between uh, the center and the constituent units and article 131 proviso is also important because that correlates to article 143 clause to the uh, advisory powers of the pre- of the supreme court under the president so there the word used is shall in article 143 clause one the word used is may so therefore so the jurisdiction of the supreme court is largely divided into original original would include writ jurisdiction as well that is under article 32 because in in a sense original for the original jurisdiction for the supreme court means the court of first institution of a particular uh, 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 list as such 
therefore the transfer jurisdiction is also included in uh, uh, the original jurisdiction because it is for the first time that you institute a list before for for a particular relief before the court then the supreme court uh, and this this would be under article 139a 139 clause a1 would be from high courts to the supreme court where substantially the same question or uh, a, a substantial question of general importance is involved in 139a2 where, uh, where where the supreme court has passed to transfer a case from one high court to the other high court there after section 25 cpc and section 406 crpc for transfer of criminal cases from one state to other and transfer of civil cases from one state to other then uh, the supreme court has appellate jurisdiction so the appellate jurisdiction is from article 132 133 134 136 and a lot of statute books from where uh, there is an appeal directly to the supreme court for example under the under section 38 of the advocates act 130 clause e or the customs act and that's so on and so forth there, there's a proper list of statute books so 132 clause 1 is where the supreme court has appellate jurisdictions uh in any civil criminal or any matter where the high court certifies that the matter matter involves a substantial question of law of interpretation of the constitution the 132 clause so you file uh, that generates a right to appeal but the supreme court is not bound by the certificate granted by the high court under 132 clause 1 and 134 clause a because the certificate is granted under sec- article 134 clause a similarly under article 133 it has civil jurisdiction but uh, only where a uh, civil appellate jurisdiction where only a uh, substantial question of general importance substantial question of law of general importance is what and article 134 has an interesting uh, connotation it says where a high court it has to be from a high court appeal from a high court where the high court uh, deals with the case where the trial court had acquitted and the high court convicts and gives death sentence so extreme ends acquittal and conviction with death sentence or where the high court itself conducted trial the high court has a power to conduct trial under section 474 crpc there there will be a right to appeal because every accused or the state concerned um, or the complainant should have a right to appeal in criminal cases from uh, at least one appeal has to be there but article 130 and this is article 134 clause 1 article 134 clause 2 granted very wide pass to the parliament to enact legislation so as to in, in consultation of the supreme court so as to uh, deal with how the powers of supreme court will function in criminal law so in this regard there is this 1970 act that is supreme court enlargement of appellate powers act 1970 so this act says that will enlarge jurisdiction and it actually does by uh, diluting article 134 clause 1 to certain extent saying that uh, uh if for example high court if, if, the, if the trial court had acquitted and the high court gives it convicts and punishes for more than 10 years life imprisonment or more than 10 years then there will be a right to appeal to the supreme court or if the high court conducts a trial and then it will uh, have a right to appeal to the supreme court if the high court had convicted and punished for a sentence for a period of more than 10 years so uh then this, these are the then then article 136 that is the party special appeal this was absent in the federal court this is this was something which was debated upon and brought in in the constitution so from every order judgment decree of any court or any authority there will be uh, an appeal to the supreme court under article 136 but you have to seek leave to appeal uh, granted to, from the supreme court in case leave to appeal is granted that particular matter is converted to either a civil appeal or a criminal appeal as the nature of may be they after uh, uh, then the supreme court has advisory jurisdiction under article 143 clause 1 so 143 clause 1 as i had said earlier is the word used is may the president may the supreme court may decide to give its opinion the supreme court's opinion is not binding but article 143 clause 2 which deals with the proviso to article 131 which uh, uh, culminates the original jurisdiction because article 131 is limited by article 262 of any river dispute because there is this 1956 act of river water disputes so then uh, in those cases the supreme court has no ju- no uh, original jurisdiction but article 143 clause 2 uses the word shall it has to be uh, if the president does then then the supreme court has to give its opinion maybe binding may not be binding but it has to give its opinion 
then practice and procedure apart from jurisdictions would involve uh, appointments of the judges and mamma uh, i'll just interject since uh, for a minute you can tell them about the type of petition since we are going upon you can touch upon curative and review also here all right all right yes 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 so they after after article 1 to 136 there is this article 137 which deals with the reviews jurisdiction of the supreme court so unlike so supreme so and this is also interesting because section 6 of the crpc gives a list of four criminal courts the supreme court as such is not a criminal court in nature and also article 360 uh, section 360 of the crpc bars that there will be any because generally there is no review in criminal law like we have section 144 in the cpc the review is absent in criminal law no criminal court can review its judgment there will be revision there will be uh, appeals but there is no review as such the supreme court under article 137 has very wide powers to even assume the responsibilities of being a criminal court when it hears a criminal appeal and in any matter civil or criminal or constitutional for the matter it can review its judgment or its order this is read with article uh, order 47 of the supreme court rules so but there is under article 47 clause 1 there is uh, this embargo on criminal review jurisdiction by the supreme court so civil review of the supreme court can happen when uh, Uh, when there is an error apparent on the face of record, or there is discovery of new facts, or the provisions mentioned in Order Forty Seven Rule One of the Code of Civil Procedure, this is what the Order Forty Seven of Supreme Court Rules also says. But in criminal law, there will be review only when there is an error apparent on the face of record. This is a limitation on it. Then once a review is dismissed, it is dismissed. There will be no subsequent review in that matter. Then. Uh, also uh, you have to, the review jurisdiction of the supreme court is separate from something which is called an ia an ia for modification clarification or an interlocutory application for you know for modification of the order for example if there is a clerical or an arithmetic error in the judgment they it can be cured by an ia for modification clarification saying that it has to be it had to be 25000 quintals but you wrote 2500 quintals so you cure the defect but for a substantive change in the order you have to file a review uh, before the court under article 137 and order 47 of the supreme court rules now the jurisdiction of the supreme court does not end at the review as well so there is something which is called a review of a review that is called a curative so this was evolved in 2002 by the supreme court in uh, in the judgment of rupa shokhara it's an, and by the nature it is clear it says curative so so if any defects remain in the judgment or the order passed by the court even after review then the supreme court has very wide powers to cure such defects under the curative jurisprudence so uh, but it has to be limited on uh, certain grounds that violation of principles of natural justice or something which was brought to the court but it was missed or there was any um, biasness involved on the part of the judge and it was not disclosed so it is highly limited but uh, in 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 the in a recent in not not recent now in uh, the nas foundation case where it was heard by justice thakur so it was in the curative after the review was this, so it was decided on 12 december 2013 by justice singh and justice mukhopadhyay so thereafter uh, justice singh retired it went into review before justice dattu the review was summarily dismissed so uh, also in, importantly so the review is not heard in an open court you have to file an application along with the review to be heard in an open court review is sent in by circulation to judges chambers uh, it is you know uh, tried that you know it may go to the same judges but in case a particular judge super annuates and the cgm constitute new bench for it, it goes in chambers the review court may allow your application for hearing in the in an open court or may dismiss it summarily now uh, in the nas foundation case after justice dattu dismissed the review petition there was this curative which was filed so curative has to be heard by a bench of five judges in chambers again there is no open hearing as such but, but while hearing that curative he said that uh, justice thakur said that uh, this involves questions of uh, large importance or a public importance so and it uh, it said that it will hear it and then uh, it went to uh, it was referred to a constitution bench as well to be decided but later on there were fresh writ petitions filed in navdeep singh johar and in section 377 was uh, dealt with accordingly in navdeep singh johar's case so this curative became infructuous and thereafter it was withdrawn otherwise this would have also led to some evolve 
uh, evolution in the curated jurisprudence so uh, then after uh, uh, review and curative i guess uh, supreme court supreme court rules 2013 earlier there were supreme court rules 1966 the supreme court rules 2013 came into picture from august 2014 that was under justice lodha who was the cgi then and this is under the powers uh, given by article 145 of the constitution so the supreme court rules have uh, orders as such they deal with who is an advocate who is an advocate on record uh, what are the powers of the registrar what are the powers of a chamber judge how is a reference made from uh, two judges to 3 to 5 to 7 to 9 to 11 to 13 and uh, uh, how petitions have to be filed everything is laid down in the supreme court rules for the for the purposes of the examination you have to study the rules very thoroughly and uh, to gain good marks i guess you have to remember certain provisions as well for example if there is a question uh, that uh, you know if there is an indigent person or a pauper and he files an appeal can you charge him as an advocate so the answer would be no that not only you can't charge him but also if you charge him you are guilty of contempt of court that is under order 18 rule 7 clause 3 of the supreme court rules so uh, the supreme court rules have to be studied very minutely and uh, writing the provision would give you an added advantage over others and for example uh, so when you when you for example if you are asked something about uh, uh, say what is, what is the jurisdiction under uh, article 1 139 clause a 1 clause a 2 depends so you have to write that you know that under order 39 or order 40 of the code this is also written so for example and uh, you have to also remember certain provisions like uh, provisions related to the pil uh, so when you see you have to uh, also study what or what you know order 26 says about or in the particular rule i guess rule 8 of the supreme court rail, rule says about uh, what are the uh, requirements in a pil petition of the details of the pil uh, petitioner details of if any pending civil or criminal cases there are revenue cases there or if he is he has to give an undertaking that he there's no personal motive behind it or oblique motive behind it so the supreme court rules have to be studied very carefully very minutely and in depth and uh, to gain marks you have to consider writing uh, uh the particular provisions from the supreme court rules and then there after uh, apart from supreme court rules there are uh, the en- the enlargement act 1970 there are advocate on record rules there is this 1954 uh, uh, order under which the supreme court passes if if any execution of any order of the supreme court particularly in original suits is to happen it does under the 1954 uh, uh, act and then there, then there are rules of the supreme court to conduct its contempt these are also very important there are questions asked from it so uh, you have to read about how how civil contempt is done how criminal contempt is done in a criminal contempt you have to get uh, a written uh, uh, authority from the attorney general or the solicitor general because criminal contempt of the court because scandalizing is involved there civil is okay civil is willful disobedience it can be by any party there is no written uh, requirement from an attorney general solicitor general so all these you have to study in depth and uh, uh you have to be very thorough with it uh namit at this point i would just like to interject with two questions on this particular mm-hmm. topic one mm-hmm. is on the recusal application because recusal was uh, too much in the last year so mm-hmm. <laughs> that is one part and second mm-hmm. part if you can tell our listeners and viewers how to structure the answer that will mm-hmm. be really helpful for them like it is on the jurisdiction suppose you have to file an original jurisdiction if a question is on original jurisdiction then how they are supposed to go about it okay 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 so uh for recusal so uh, any interested party it can't be by a third party by a party to a particular list an application may be filed for a particular judge to recuse with the grounds mentioned there that uh, that a judge may have put, may have acted for an interested party in that case uh, earlier as a high court judge or may have appeared as an advocate in uh, the earlier round so primarily recusal is understood to be uh, uh, something which it's an allegation of biasness in the litigant's mind 
but a recent judgment by the supreme court has shifted the paradigms of how a recusal is to be understood it shifts from a litigant's point of view to a judge's point of view saying that the judge's conscience should feel or a judge himself or herself should feel that i may be biased i don't know how long will it go but i don't uh, but this is the law right now regarding uh, answers to be written in uh, uh, in in the exam for example if you take article 131 so to get an added advantage you can start with section 204 of the federal court that this was uh, this is the parent of the provision enshrined in article 131 and then 131 what does 131 abc say then you can also mention that what does the proviso to article 131 say because there is a necessarily uh, there is a necessary jurisdiction under article 143 clause 2 related to it then how the how uh, how the and also so the, again interestingly so under article 374 clause 2 of the constitution all the pending matters before the federal court came before the supreme court one so for the first time when the supreme court exercised its original jurisdiction it at the end of that matter it declined to was under article 374 clause 2 because there was this case which was transferred to it now article 131 uh then you have to mention that th- there is this uh, uh limitation imposed by the constitution itself on article 131 that is under article 262 and under article, article 262 that supreme court has uh, the parliament has framed this 1956 act of interstate river disputes which has to go to a specialized tribunal the supreme court will not entertain it but for that implementation of the award passed by such tribunal you can come to the supreme court then you'll have to go to a series of judgments uh around i guess six seven important judgments the state of rajasthan was you know the state of karnataka and the, the, the series of judgments and then uh, you have to supplant it with a recent case law so i guess the recent case law would be the mulla periyar dam judgment by the court in which uh, uh, article 131 was under that was between state of uh karnataka and uh, other karkerl and tamil nadu on the kaveri river so uh, if you so that answer should be written in a lucid manner in, in a particular chronology so that when uh, because the examiner knows nothing except your answer book before him so he'll just see okay, okay and so, and i don't know if uh, so it it has to be and you have to manage time as well you can't invest all so if If, if a question on Article One Thirty One carries, for example, twenty marks, then you'll have to write everything in detail. If that question carries only five marks, then you can skip few things. You can mention case laws that these are the case laws dealing with Article One Thirty One, but you may skip mentioning about what was held in those cases. So, and also to get an added advantage, you can uh, you know say that, for example, uh, there's a there's a there's very landmark judgment on Article One Thirty One which. uh dealt which was decided by a majority of 4 is to 3 and that is that is a very minute majority so you can say that this is the majority opinion and the dissenting opinion held this and you have to also mention that uh, it has to be state versus union or state versus state it can't be instrumentalities of state so for example you can't uh, go and file a contract uh, dispute by railways against the union of india uh, so yeah this is how it has to be written in a very lucid manner so as the and you can what you can try is uh, you can highlight by using a pencil your answers uh, so that you know in, in case something is striking in case you have a striking feature in your answer you can just underline it so that when the examiner sees the question paper uh, the answer booklet he'll just see okay, okay this uh, uh, aspirant has some knowledge on this so you'll be awarded marks accordingly So that is important for clearing the exam, which is otherwise uh, quite yeah. a challenge. I, I guess the examiner should know that you possess knowledge. At yeah. the end of the day, it it does. Not, I don't because these are all senior advocates who take the uh, answer booklets. It does not matter to them that you know. So what yeah. matters to them more is that this, for example, if I'm uh, making this uh, particular candidate pass this exam, he or she should add to the value already the paper has. so they check the exam they check the answer booklet with this perspective so you have to do some value addition right and your writing should be legible i mean legible. we have practically yes. forgotten how to write with the hand uh, by the mm-hmm. time we sit for the or exam 
uh, well, because I you're think, I, mean, I have particularly people. faced that challenge. I actually practice writing uh, some of the answers before writing my paper because just to check the speed, probably you have to do that. Uh, you have to do that. For example, uh, now the next we'll discuss is the drafting paper. Yeah. So, you know, you don't get a computer to draft there. In three hours, you have to draft four petitions by handwriting in the Supreme Court of India under so-and-so. So you'll have to practice for legible handwriting. So for the drafting paper, a uh, few interesting things. Maybe uh, you have to remember the certificate which the AOR gives because we all copy-paste it, but uh, it has to be written by hand. So there are four major ingredients which are, which are certificate by the AOR is to carry. You have to remember them, write them in that particular uh, chronology. And then for the drafting paper, you have to, so to get an added advantage, you have to, uh, I guess you have to, you know, be very precise with the format. So for example, so SLP civil or SLP criminal will definitely come in the paper because that, that consumes primary jurisdiction of the court. So you have to practice the format. So there's a very subtle change in uh, the declarations made under the rules in SLP civil and SLP criminal. You have to remember that. You also have to remember uh, the jurisdiction exercised. For example, there may be tricky questions which actually have to be have to go to the Supreme Court in way of a civil appeal. But uh, people, you know, tend to uh, go under an SLP because SLPs. So the only limitation on an SLP is uh, if there's armed forces involved. So there, it has to go under Section 3031 of the AFT Act. That may be one. Also, the affidavit clause. In if you are asked to draft an affidavit, then the affidavit has to be. This is something which is very very important as well. So affidavit has to be uh, by whosoever signs the affidavit, he has to say that I've read the contents or if I read Hindi, the contents have been uh, read over to me in Hindi and the affidavit has to be followed with a verification. This verification would include something which is based on your personal knowledge. For example, you'll say that para so-and-so is based on my personal knowledge and para so-and-so is based on the legal advice tendered to me, which I believe to be true and correct. So you have to verify your affidavit. Not so that is why the affidavit in the Supreme Court is followed by a verification to this effect. So uh, and particularly in original suits, if you are asked to file, uh, also you have to remember when you file when you draft a civil appeal, the cost title has to share, has to say that it is an appellant versus a respondent. In an original suit, you have to write plaintiff and defendant. In SLPs and other preliminaries, you have to write petitioner and respondent. This is, this is very important, something which we missed generally, but it is important from the point of view of examiners. Then, uh, 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 yeah. so, uh, so... You have the, to give the cost title even when you are drafting the petition. It is just not that you start writing the synopsis and list of date and petition. You have to actually write the way uh, it will be presented. Huh. And you have to also so the cost see... title and everything. Uh, you have to see if the question papers say if, if the question papers say that you don't have to write synopsis list of dates, you may skip it. Otherwise, yes. you have to do that. You can choose the cost title to be X Y Z petitioner versus P Q R if the names are not given. If the names are given, you have to use those names. And you have to, for example, if you are asked to draft a writ, so re respondent number one has to be the state or the union. Respondent number one against whom you are claiming a relief, even if there is a uh, is state instrumentality involved? The cost title has to be state versus a state or state of PQR or union of India or union of if any other example is given in the question paper. So, and uh, for the drafting paper, I think you should carry a scale and a pencil with you because uh, you'll have to mark, uh, uh, you have to, you can, you know, do a, a pencil by using pencil and scale, you can draw. A particular margin so as to it gives a good impression to the reader and uh, for example and, and the grounds have to be razor sharp this is very very important for example if you're drafting a bail application or an slp for a bail uh, you, so you have to you know say that if for example if it's a utp for example there's a and there's an under trial prisoner 
you have to say that i am incarcerated for this this period from so and so in so and so and when you and then you have to plead that for example these are the six major grounds of bail in case you know a particular good recent case law or a landmark judgment on that aspect is well you can use that or if the hints are dropped in the question paper you can use that and then you'll have to uh, and in the bail in, in the prayer clause of uh, the bail you have to plead to the satisfaction of because the supreme court directly can't release someone on bail the supreme court will direct someone to be released on bail to the satisfaction of the trial court or of the concerned authorities so you have to plead in your slp that grant special leave to appeal uh, so and so so and so against so and so so and so so and so and grant ad interim ex parte bail or bail to uh, the petitioner or to the petitioners to the satisfaction of so and so if there is an under trial prisoner to so the in st case number so and so so and so or if uh, there is no charge sheet filed uh, till now then to the satisfaction of uh, the concerned uh, uh, police station or in connection with the fir number so and so in relation to so and so police station that you have to expressly plead in the prayer clause as well and for example uh, if you are seeking an anticipatory bail so in anticipatory bail the direction is to the concerned arresting officer or to the concerned io to release on bail in case you are taken into custody so that has to also be categorically pleaded this is very important this is something which you generally miss in drafting and this is something which is with the from the examiner's point of view is important and uh, for example and and you have to use the language of the act for example if you are going in an slp against uh, a dismissal under section 482 for quashing you have to use the language mentioned in section 482 uh, so that inherent powers and abuse of process of law whatever you are pleading it has to flow from the section and if you are drafting a writ for that matter you have to say that you know that you have to seek issuance of a writ so issue and so the expression used in article 32 is then an appropriate writ order or direction or in the nature of so and so or any other appropriate writ order or direction so the expression used in the particular provision has to be uh, there in your prayer clause and if in case you don't know about any particular prayer as to how it should be pleaded then you can go to a judgment and see at the last pair of the judgment that what has been awarded so you'll come to know that this is how the prayer clause should be in uh, your uh, drafting papers and for preliminary such as uh, you saying something right uh, so namit coming on to the structure of the paper uh, i understand still one question is compulsory and three are optional i mean three more you have to do there is a choice yeah so what generally right? happens is that there are eight questions in total out of which you have to do 5 which will carry 20 marks each so uh, what and it depend it will depend from person to person my trick would be to do the best uh, the most you know the best you would know to do it first for example you think that you are very good at drafting for example there is a contempt petition sort for a civil contempt so, and you think you know um, what should be in that so you use it you answer it uh, first so when the uh, examiner opens your paper book answer book he or she you know gives it gets with a good impression and also see for example for a contempt application for a civil contempt you have to plead with willful disobedience of the court's order so the exact expressions used in section 21c of the 1971 act and in the supreme court rules on contempt and in article 129 you have to plead them so because these rules are framed under section 23 of the contempt act that is the 1971 act for example and if there is a criminal complaint you have to say that you know the attorney general or the solicitor general consented to this criminal complaint this criminal contempt being filed or if the attorney general or the solicitor general said no then you have to say that you know that they said no but i am still filing it it may go to the court it may not go to the court but it depends and for example if you are filing a transfer petition uh you have to plead comparative hardship and you have to list the factors on which why you can't go to that particular court or if there is a threat to your life and limb or if you are unable to go because of some medical reasons you have to expressly plead them 
and the ground should not be repetitive i think uh, 10 grounds are sufficient 10 to 12 grounds are sufficient for the purposes of the examination but they shouldn't be repetitive they should be focused and they should be razor sharp there should be no active passive involved you know shuttling words here there in the sentence and making another ground that you should avoid that gives a negative impression and uh, uh, for example in slps uh, what you say is questions of law but these questions of law are not limited because they are judgments of the supreme court which say that you know the supreme court has very wide powers under article 136 so they are not limited to questions of law but when you write questions of law you have to write uh, the issues of law involved you can't raise questions of fact in uh, questions of law and you can't even raise question mixed questions of law and fact they have to be purely questions of law it is then when you uh, gain more marks and plus the format yes format is the primary thing you can't diverge from the format given by the court in which petitions have to be filed so i guess for the drafting paper these would be the primary tips and, uh, and the uh, focus Mamad, uh, uh, coming on to the length of the answers that a student i mean uh, that a candidate will write considering mm-hmm. the time constraint how how many pages you will roughly say Each is is page. I don't know. It it will depend on ki. Uh, it will depend on the handwriting every individual has. But I guess the number of grounds should be ten to twelve. The number mm-hmm. of questions of law can range between four, four, five, or if uh, uh, if the time constraints are there, three, three or three also okay. But you have to. Ha. Huh. And also for the grounds, see, and I, I, yeah. So when you plead, uh, for example, if you are drafting a writ petition. and you are uh, challenging for example constitutional validity of a legislative enactment so you have to differentiate it totally so uh, a writ sought for a legislative enactment and a writ sought for an administrative action these are two completely different writs they uh, they have the grounds are totally different for example if you if for a legislative action against a legislative action you will say breach of fundamental rights you'll say lack of legislative competence now you can also say manifest arbitrariness because after the shaira bano and the subrimala judgment this is the expression used by justice nariman saying that uh, manifest uh, if that that is legislative enactment can also go for being manifestly arbitrary but for an administrative action you have to uh, go by the wetnesbury principles you have to uh, show procedural irregularity fettering uh, uh, discretion discretion not exercised wetness but something which we call wetness that wetness very unreasonableness and violation of principles of natural justice so for administrative actions you can't or arbitrariness you can't directly jump to uh, you have to go for to uh, violation of part 3 of the constitution but that alone would not satisfy you have to plead uh, 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 the wetness very principles as such as well there is a recent judgment by justice indra benerjee and justice uh, bhanumati i guess that is sarvapalli ramayya that is 2019 4scc 500 i guess uh, that that gives you an insight of as to how administrative actions have to be dealt with also interestingly for uh, uh, legislative enactments you can't go to basic this is a very common mistake so if you are challenging a legislative enactment you can't jump to the basic structure doctrine basic structure do- that something you know uh, uh, violates basic basic structure was always thought to be for the constitutional amendments except if there is uh, that is ir coelo para 148 of ir coelo so it says that the two filter mechanism has to be there for the ninth schedule laws you have to first test it with uh Uh, basic structure. If it fails there, then part three of the constitution. But you can't for ordinary. So this is a very common mistake in drafting. You don't, don't say basic structure directly if you're challenging an ordinary legislation. Only for constitutional amendments you can go to basic structure. And also when you plead basic structure, you have to show what part of the constitution, what structure of the constitution, which is basic to it, is being violated by this particular amendment. so i guess this is how drafting has to be so now we can move to paper 3 uh, which is a professional ethics and advocacy so professional ethics and advocacy you'll have to study few bar council rules okay. and 
to reach the top. And two judgments like the Supreme Court Bar Association judgment, the Mahipal Singh Rana judgment, the Amshad Ansari judgment. These judgments you'll have to study. But apart from it, there is this wonderful book by Mr. Venkata Ramani, I guess. And for professional ethics, I guess the classes which you'll attend conducted by the Supreme Court or the Sonia Sina Advocate, whosoever will check the exam, those classes are sufficient in nature. So, uh, but the Bar Council rules, duties to colleagues, duties to opponents, duties towards the court, duties at the bar generally duties to your clients these are very important there will be uh, questions asked from it that is the book by mr venkata ramani he is a senior advocate of the court it is available on the supreme court website also you can download the book from there also uh, uh, they, 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 there are these books available as well yes and now coming to the paper which people fear the most it is the leading cases uh, leading okay so there are there are there's this list of 44 cases given by the supreme court few of them are overruled few of them are still there few of them are under consideration for example but you you should be very updated see that you there is no shortcut to it you'll have to study uh, leading cases you have to read all of them you have to go through all of them trick involved maybe that you get these photocopies of the head notes by the supreme court uh, uh by the okay. sti that ha huh. so because in the examination you are given the supreme the scr head notes there is this bound volume which around i guess 1000 of them they have printed and kept you won't be allowed to write anything or underline anything in it but they you'll be given those scr head notes using them you can you know do but you'll be able to find what is written in the particular head note for example few particular head notes are totally useless Uh, they won't help you in the exam, so you should know where to find what. So that is important. Also, for leading cases, it is not only important to know what was done; it is also important to know what was the dissenting opinions. So you'll have to, and judge wise, you'll have to know in, uh, for example, in T M A P I, who said what, and uh, for example, uh, and and in a in a lot of uh, a judgment will be dissenting opinion so you should know who said what indra zani for example so those scr head notes will be helpful in you know keeping you you don't have to remember the exact points because you'll be but don't do this don't just copy paste from uh, uh the head notes into your uh, answer booklets that gives a very negative impression that will go against so you you have read it and you have got the head notes in front of you It becomes a very simple task. So it, it is partially open book paper, huh. but you have to be smart enough to know where is what, and you can know that where only if you have read. It. Yes, and and use it in your own language because otherwise, for example, if they ask you what was the ratio in so and so, and you open that particular head note and you start writing, you you won't be able to finish it in three hours because <laughs> there will be so much written. So you should know what is written. Also, I believe it is important to have. social legal understanding of and, and i guess this is what the supreme court also wants the examiners also want a social legal background of what is happening for example when you uh, read selvi versus state of karnataka so that is a landmark judgment because so there was this dr narko she used to administer the truth serum which was popularly known as the truth serum and particularly in uh, high profile cases and uh, Uh, cases involving terrorists the, the truth serum sale be uh, the truth serum that particular dr narko used was administered and uh, they after confessions were extracted from those uh, accused so sale versus state of karnataka deals with testimonial compulsions it also deals with um, right to privacy to certain extent and then after the recent case putta swami judgment where the nine judgment of the court held that you have a right to privacy and that is also important because right to privacy was uh, debated in the constituent assembly and the founding fathers and mothers categorically said that okay no we can't include this as a fundamental right and the judiciary supplanted it to the jurisprudence of part 3 of the constitution that that is very important in the context but you have to also see kadak singh mp sharma then putta swami and after putta swami the debate on whether privacy can be physical privacy and mental privacy so uh, so when you frame an answer on selvi you have to go to kathir 
Kathir Kalu Ogar, that is 1964, then Kadak Singh, MP Sharma. What did Selvi say? And the recent nine judge, uh, in a sense, supervision by the court in K.S. Potaswamy, and after the day after the debate on physical and mental privacy. And uh, also, if you'll add few provisions, for example, Section 53A CRPC was not there. That is, in rape cases, how do you extract something from the accused? So that was a medical examination of the accused that was not there when Selvi uh, was there. So yeah, so you can sub, you can make your answer uh, in a way uh, adventurous as such, so that when the examiner reads it, he or she feels that okay, this candidate knows the deal kind of a thing, and you are awarded accordingly. Similarly, when you read uh, the cases related to reservations, so there is there is. A, this chronology to the reservation dynamics in the country and the, with the constant political developments as well. Because reservations as such, they have upturned uh, governments. So uh, you, that reservation dynamics has to be understood with the political developments in the country. So yeah, and reservations are and multiple types of reservation, for example, minority reservations and uh, reservations in uh, uh, you know a vertical reservation horizontal reservation reservation towards women it has to be understood in a particular political context but that will happen if you for example the trick may be to go through a judgment and uh, then uh, update yourself by reading about it or googling it also see this list of 44 cases is exhaustive so generally they don't ask anything beyond this but uh, the topics associated with these leading cases may be asked. For example, uh, like for example, we have Bangalore Water Supply. So Bangalore Water Supply is a 1978 judgment by the Supreme Court. That is by five judges. So um, it has something. It, it 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 was interesting in the sense that you know the opinions were given later, and. Uh, uh, there's a very so the entire judgment of Krishna this is Krishna here goes in a certain manner, then suddenly twists the other way. So in in state of UP, so it was referred to a seven judge bench, and further in the state of UP versus Jabir Singh, it was again referred to a nine judge bench. Mm -hmm. So you, so if you if you write something about Bangalore water supply, what is the definition of industry? Deals definition of industry. You have to also mention that. Uh, the recent update that this was referred because of this this reason in I guess 2017 5 SCC and 2005 9 SCC I guess as far as I remember so to a 7 judge and to a 9 judge bench so uh, and for example Swami Shraddhananda is there Swami Shraddhananda uh, you have to accompany Swami Shraddhananda by uh, V. Shri Haran's case that, that is where uh, 3 is to 2 majority kicks in so it has to be understood in a certain manner. And V. Sriharan again has an interesting backdrop of uh, the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi and how, you know, commutation, how political angles are there. So don't write political angles because the senior advocate who checks your paper may be politically inclined here, there. So, but you have to subtly mention facts. It, it has to be fact-based. No one wants to read your opinions as such. They have their own opinions. They want to read what happened. What are the facts? Uh, so yeah, so you can make your answers better that way. That will help you. Marks. And Namaz, I'll just quickly go through the questions which the attendees have asked, and you yeah. can answer them. Like the first one is like when you have to intern under an AOR, do you have to be physically present in Delhi? Like somebody from Jaipur or somebody from Bombay, High Court, they work in. So there's this for an internship you have to be in, for an externship you may not be in. Yeah. So what you can do is you can do an externship with an AOR. The AOR can assign you drafting work. The and then AOR. But for the training you have to be physically present, because uh, otherwise that negates the purpose. But yeah, there are people who just give. If you if you are connected, they'll just give you certificate, and after one year you can drop in. But uh, yeah, it's better to be in yes. Delhi. But there's there's no embargo to it. If if you're unable to come, yeah. But for an internship, you have to as a law student, learning you have to be present. For an externship, uh, it's okay. 
then i mean after you are already having a four year practice and then moving for one year in delhi that becomes difficult for many people it becomes and difficult so now, you can take a certificate yes then there is yeah i mean that we all do you know okay now yeah. coming to the next one uh, the query is about are solicitors recognized by indian solicitor society they are exempted from ur exam yeah so you can just expand so, yeah so so uh, under under order uh, under order uh at order 4 rule 5 somewhere in the supreme court they are exempted you have to file an application and a certificate to that effect along with your application with uh, when you file for your uh, ur uh, uh, when, when you fill the form you have to give an uh, give the originals show the originals to that effect and you'll be exempted if you have, if you are a sole solicitor yeah. and there is one repetitive question which is coming whether there is any limitation on number of attempts that a person can write i guess there are four attempts limited to four attempts right. i'll have to check this once but i guess four attempts four attempts this is what i also recall that i think it was uh, something but like uh, but one shouldn't be so negative <laughs> yeah, <not really. laughs> i guess four attempts right and um, uh, another question which is of practical difficulty is about the radius within and which your office should be there hmm. people are asking a query on that uh, what if somebody is not able to get it does his or her registration get cancelled or no not not registration so this this is after you become an aor so for example if i have cleared the aor exam now when i fill up my form to get a code i have to say that this is my address and this address is within 16 kilometers radius from um, the supreme court the reason being that for example if you are called at odd hours for example if a matter is listed at 3 pm suddenly because there is some emergency situation so if you are away you you know that you'll take time and you won't be able to reach on time so that is why the 16 kilometers radius issue is there but this is after you become an ewa there is no necessity to have an office within 16 kilometers before or at the time of writing the examination and even the get... requirement to have a registered clerk is after you become an ewa after you, you become have to have a registered clerk as well now you can keep two registered clerks and one registered clerk can be a registered clerk to two awrs the registered clerk should not be a proper and there should be no Uh, uh, criminal cases again running against him because then thereafter this proximity card is issued to the clerks and clerks use it to and fro and the clerks file it with your authority uh, using that uh, proximity card as well. And one more repeated question is whether it is necessary to be a member of Supreme Court Bar Association to no. take your exam. That is no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. That is not at all a requirement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other queries you would like to put? Right. Okay. This is an interesting query. A person says that he wrote his LLB and he qualified as a judge, and after five years he has practiced as civil judge. Now he wants to take AOR exam. Mm. So, so did he suspend? He did he suspend his license? Because if you have suspended so, your license, then uh, that particular period will not be counted as. continuous uh, continuity in practice then you'll have to wait right and uh, you can just give them the list of books that you have referred while preparing your exams i guess the best way is to go through uh, the bair act the supreme court rule have to be read from the bair act in entirety there is no mm-hmm. shortcut to it you have to try and memorize the provisions and they help you in general practice as well ha huh. and provision to the constitution the expressions used in the constitution they are very very important they have to be written in the answers as it is then there are few judgments which are landmark and i guess there is this practice and procedure book by uh, uh, mr the raju ramchandran sir it is also an huh. ebc product <laughs> so yeah that so is also yeah agarwala's book which is being revised by raju ramchandran sir practice mm. and procedure i think that this is standard book mm. i don't and think I there is any other book i am working on this drafting book so <laughs> okay so you have a ready audience for uh, otherwise which book did you use for drafting 
no i didn't use any book for drafting it's just simple Because formats yeah big one ha you have to be very specific with the prayer clause and the grounds you have to plead what you actually need it has to be pleaded from the provision it has to flow from the provision and this is something standard with all drafting i guess for all trial courts and high courts drafting is well i i don't think there's a good book for drafting but leading cases also there is the short uh, book which comes which is titled as the landmark judgments or something or leading cases it is available i guess in the supreme court uh, uh, where, where you get photocopied beneath aake ghar gaye guess or beneath sitar war so there is this book available you can get it for you can there okay one last thing that uh, some people have asked but i think i should have asked you in the beginning why do you think supreme court requires aor there is a specific provision on the duties of an aor if you can mm. enlighten them on this so the see uh, supreme court is the highest court of the country and anyone who is enrolled with any bar council anywhere can practice and argue before the supreme court but to fix accountability the filing is done through an advocate on record so the advocate on record is personally liable for what is being filed anyone can argue with the authorization of the advocate on record but any junior advocate not necessarily a senior advocate anyone with even you know 3 days experience at bar can argue before the supreme court there is no limitation on it but the filing is done through neva for example if the advocate who is appearing before the court makes a statement that uh, uh you know that or gives an undertaking and then vanishes it it will be very difficult for the supreme court to you know uh, get hold of him so the liability is being fixed on the advocate on record because the filing is done through him so he is personally liable in case a wrong undertaking is given and because in every case his presence is marked he or has to be personally present in the court when his when a case filed by him or her is being heard in the court so personal liabilities are being fixed and uh, there is this very famous case i guess uh, you will remember this is bs chauhan uh, rameshwar prasad goel's case and uh, there was this another case i, I remember the, i don't remember the name now i guess something starting with b b k shukla something something yeah so uh, he was reprimanded by the court he was the contempt proceedings were initiated against him and on when the senior advocates interjected then only it was relaxed but not before uh by giving his turn structures structures yeah so name lending is a problem but that should name not lending. that should not that is that is against ethics in case you are asked this question in professional ethics say no you will never lend your name expressly written In but the, i mean if you look at the practical problem there are many lawyers who have to file 20 25 cases which are there and they cannot be physically present in each and every court so and if name lending was not there perhaps you know advocates yeah. who like for, for example i'll say about me i'm say about anyone else my practice would have got really hampered if they were not he was willing to sign for us <laughs> but yeah i know that is a problem like uh, we all know those names <laughs> so if you guys have any other queries uh, we will take uh, people are asking them to suggest some book on the constitutional law also plus is llm is useful for aor does it give any edge no, for no, aor no 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 not at all llm i think is uh, it you, no one asks if you are uh, if you have studied llm no one cares if you have studied llm it is neither mandatory nor necessary and uh, some books you can refer uh, on the constitution for the constitution i guess uh, uh, mp jain is good our own so mp shukla was now updated by professor mp singh yeah so that is yeah. there as well any so, other like uh, Avinandan will not stop marketing, so yeah. It's <laughs> 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 a good book. No, no, it's actually a good book. And so, if you achha, ask my favorite, then I would like it. to go to the general hospital. It is not exactly the book on the constitution, but insight it gives you is wonderful. Yes, yes. and also these four exams they are uh, consecutive. So, for example, nine, tenth, eleven, twelfth. 
there is yeah. no gap between the exams there are three hours exams and uh, generally from uh, i guess 10 to 1 yes 10 to 1 and the, the exam is being conducted in the supreme court premises so the court rooms they are emptied and uh, chairs and uh, tables are uh, you know uh, kept as uh, as an ad hoc measure a classroom type of a setting with a chair and a desk is there and uh-huh. uh, rows are made where students sit with the proper social distancing supreme court staff will uh, continuously be there to monitor you so in case you have plans that you'll cheat and all mm-hmm, does not happen <laughs> so you have to a uh, lot of like lot of people they write this exam and the passing percentage is quite low so if you leave out this current batch which namath has passed so before that i think we have got around 2700 or so awards 27 or 2800 huh now till now now 3000 with this till now till now as in uh, from the inception of the court right. so you can very well guess that so it is a tough exam it's not an easy one and none of us aced it so that's wonderful all right i think that brings us to the end of the session uh, i don't think there are any other uh, questions that we have uh anyone else for any other last questions so they are asking where they can contact us for further information uh we have our website epclearning.com uh there we have got other courses also and uh, if this will be web- available on the youtube as well as on yeah, the so website. you can if you have any general questions that you can post on youtube also and this webinar will continue to be available so you can still register on this and your uh, recording of the webinar will be uh, played back obviously uh, we will not have a live session then so you can register and post your questions there as well um, otherwise it is obviously going to be on youtube so you can post them there and uh, you can write to us i think at um, you can uh, write to us at Say instructor at the rate ebclearning.com. So if you write to us there, that is again instructor at the rate ebclearning.com. There again, uh, we can try and answer these questions. Though I cannot promise that we'll answer all of them, but yes, for some time at least we can try. I think social media is the best. Uh, that is where we can try and answer uh, most of your questions. Yeah, Namath is also there on the social media. Just search. Yeah. <laughs> i think that will also benefit uh, the maximum number of people so if a question is answered there then uh, people will be able to have access to it yeah. okay one very important last question is coming people who they are saying they are working as a in house counsel uh, can mm. they also take or exam because they have joined a full time job so mm. uh, they are not a practicing lawyer they might have surrendered their uh, license so if, you, if you have, if you have surrendered your license then uh, because you have to get this continuity certificate from your bar council so okay. it will be written in it so it has to be 4 years uh, that will that will yeah. be a but problem. if you are working with a law firm then uh, you can also write your okay. that is not a problem because then you are on a retainership you work as an advocate on a particular retainer so that is okay there is no i mean but if you are a full salaried employee then under the bar council rules uh, you are in, not into practice you can't be into practice then. I think there's one more question which relates to the internship. I think do you have to be there in Delhi and uh, to be able to do your internship? If you or? if you know if you know the AOR, you can you know uh, get it. It's it's so as per rules you have to be. But in case you are not, see, that is not something which someone harps upon. You just get certificate by the AOR commencement and completion. That's it. Okay. It has to be from the same AOR that you have. Same AOR. <laughs> and one last question that people are asking is there any minimum number of cases or wakalat nama that a person has to file no. before supreme court before he or she becomes eligible no no not at all that is only for the scba membership scba membership is not required for uh, writing the aor exam they are totally two different unconnected things so i think uh we can i think end the session 
It's, yeah, because uh, questions will keep flowing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you for joining thank us. You so yeah. Thank you, sir. This is uh, one of many webinars that we have. We have uh, quite a few webinars which are coming up as well. So uh, do look at our emails in case uh, you, uh, uh, I mean, have, uh, of course, we have your emails through your registration. So we'll be informing you further. But do try and share it on social media so that your friends, etc., can also uh, join and uh, the maximum number of people can uh, benefit out of this. Yeah. So uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, in this time of COVID, of course, be safe and uh, look forward uh, to meeting you all in the next few sessions. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Namit. Thank you, Charu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.